Guaranteed. Anybody here doesn't have any troubles? <laughs> I didn't think so. Right? Trouble. Yeah. I'm not going to go there right at the moment. In this life, you will have troubles. But God promises us the big life. Right? He promises us this big God life by faith. And, and, and now I want, to, I want to talk a little bit about Emunah. There are Hebrew scholars, there are rabbis who spend their whole lives studying this one word, Emunah. Right? The translation of, of faith, of, of Emunah as faith, I mean, it, it translates, but it doesn't bring across the power. Emunah is the kind of faith that says, God is good, God is for me, God has a plan, I don't understand it, it's all going to be okay. That's Emunah. Emunah is a drive home from a bad doctor's appointment. And say, God's for me, and it's all going to be okay. Emunah is you lose your job that you had for 20 years, and you got a mortgage, and you're driving home to tell your wife about it. Eminah is, this is a good thing. God's doing something here, right? The Hebrew concept of Eminah will change if you, if you let it, it will change the way you think about everything that happens in life. God is good, he's for me, Right? Was it the New Testament says he works all things out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his commitment. No, I just thought. But anyway, he said the New Testament says that he works, he, he doesn't say everything is good, but he says he works out all things for our good. That is the concept of Aminah. So what are you going through this morning? What are you struggling with this morning? What did you come here with tied around your neck? Is it your health? Is it your kids? Is it your finances? What are you struggling with this morning? And, that, and do you see the struggle as a gift? Do you see the struggle as, as a way, as I'm you know? I have a friend named Jerry, and every time I tell him about something in my life that I'm not happy about, he says, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> you know? If you were 80, I'd want you. <laughs> you know? Come on, buddy. Seriously. Oh, that's wonderful. It's not wonderful. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. God's doing something. He's up to something. What did God say to Habakkuk here? He says, buddy, listen, I'm up to something. I got this. It's not your timeline. It's not how you like it. It's not what you want. Hmm. But you're not me. I was oftentimes think about the end of Job. I don't like the book of Job. The book of Job bothers me. Anybody here who just loves the book of Job? <laughs> Right? The book of Job bothers me. Um, and I, I don't really think God cares that it bothers me, but it bothers me. But I like the end of it, where God says, where were you? Where were you when I formed the universe? Where were you when I did all this? You know? And, Job, and what does Job say? Hey, you're right. I wasn't there. Changing the way we see life by faith, allowing Eminah to affect the way we see our life and the way we see our circumstances is difficult but good. And God's answer to Habakkuk is resonates. I believe it's in I believe it's in Romans. It's in Romans chapter one. It's in Hebrews, and I think it also shows up in James. Three times in the New Testament, this concept of the just will live by faith shows right back up. This is not an Old Testament concept. This is, this is like, it's, 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 a, it's a spiritual reality like gravity is a reality, right? If I drop this right now, what happens? Right? And Scotty's a mechanical guy. He's new today, right? What happens if I drop this? It's going, it's going to fall, right? 9.8 meters per second. It's going down. If I drop it and it goes up, <laughs> I don't want to drop it because I don't want to break it. If I drop it, it's going down, right? The just 
living by faith is spiritual reality, just like gravity is a reality. How did Moses get to heaven? How did, how did Aaron get to heaven? How did Joshua get to heaven? By faith. Hebrews chapter 11 goes through the faith chapter. This guy, 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 this guy. You go in the Bible and you look at all those guys and what and, and gals, guys and gals, and what do they have in common? They're all just regular people like us who lived regular lives, who struggled and failed. Hebrews chapter 11 is all about faith. It's all about immunon. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. That's you. Okay? That's you. Go home today and think about that. Next time you get in an argument with somebody, think about I want you to think about that verse. Right? The proud one, his soul is not right within him. Right? And then the righteous will live by faith. Sadiq, Haya, and Yunah. Remember those words. Sadiq, Haya, and Yunah. Because you are the just. You are the just. You are the justified. You've been declared innocent. And you've been set out into a, you've been set out into big life with the power of the Holy Spirit. And with Jesus' sole purpose to sanctify you and make you look more like him every day. And sometimes he does, sometimes he allows things that we don't like to make us look like him. But we will live by faith. We do live by faith, but we will live by faith. And he's coming. Might not be today. Might not be tomorrow. But he's coming. And friends, we want to live faith lives, don't we? Do you want to get up in the morning and have your butt like four feet behind you on the carpet? Is that what you want? Or do you want to live a big life? And a big life looks different to so many, it looks different to so many people. But we want big life. And God wants to give us big life. And he gave us everything we need to have big life. And now you know the key. Faith is the key. I want to close this morning. Um, I was going to tell you a funny story about the peach. And I didn't. Because I wasn't sure how to work it in. I'm not even sure it's appropriate. But I've had the privilege of going to the Holy Land. And I've been to Lakeish. And Lakeish is pretty cool. Right? And... When Sennacherib's army got to Lachish, they devastated the place. They did things you can't even imagine to people who didn't deserve it, right? And, and the people of Israel to this day have not forgotten that. When you go to Lachish, there are monuments in Lachish. There's a, actually the siege ramp, because back in the day, you know, they couldn't hire the JLG lift from, you know, from uh, Allenwood Equipment and swing up over the swing up over the wall. If you want to get over a 50-foot wall back in the day, you had to build a siege ramp. So the siege ramp is still at Lachish. And, and so the people of Israel are still mad about this. What so was that, 700 B.C.? And we're, you know, two, so that, that's 2,700 years ago, and they're still mad about it. That's how horrible it was. But God made it right. God made it right. Whatever it is that you're walking through this morning, it will all be made right. Not in our time, not in our way, but God is good and he's for you. Let me pray for you. Lord, I needed that message as much as everybody else did. At least as much as everybody else did. And Lord, it's hard for us to live by faith. And you identify why it's hard because we're proud and we want to do it our way. We think we know better. We think we have all the answers. But Lord, we declare before you this morning as a people that you are sovereign and that you're God and that we are not. And that we were not there when you formed the universe. And we, we accept and we rejoice 
and we give thanks for the sacrifice and the blood of Jesus and the justification and the big life that it brings. Lord Jesus, I pray a big life for each one in this room today for your glory in Jesus' name. silent when the wicked 
swallows up the man more righteous than he. For thou makest men like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with the hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his seam. He rejoices and exults. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and burns incest to his seam. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly slaying nations forever? Now, what's Habakkuk doing here? I didn't realize what, tra what translation this is. Is that King James? No. Revised Standard. Yeah, so that's okay. What he's doing, Habakkuk is kind of yelling at God. He's kind of yelling at God. Things are kind of ugly in his life. Things are kind of ugly in his nation. Things are kind of ugly in the neighborhood. He's not happy about the injustice that he sees. He's not happy that he perceives that God is silent. He feels like maybe God should be doing something that God's not doing. And basically in the first chapter of Habakkuk, he yells at God. Now that, that might sound sacrilegious to you, or it might sound normal. Don't raise your hands. Maybe, I guess you could raise your hand if you never yelled at God. Because everybody yells at God. In, sometimes you do it in a, in a quiet way, sometimes you do it in your own way. But we've all had those moments where we yell at God. You know, Lord, why are you doing this? What are you doing? I mean, Habakkuk is basically saying, Lord, what are you doing? And then I love, chap I love it in chapter 2. Look at what he says in chapter 2. This is really good. Now, I did not study this version, but I'm sure it will be good. He says, I will take my stand to watch and station myself on the tower and look forth to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. What's he saying? He says, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to sit here and wait because I just yelled at God. And when you yell at God, most of the time, he'll yell back. You know? So he says, I'm going to sit here and wait. I'm going to sit here and wait for it. Look at verse 2. And the Lord answered me. Write the vision, make it plain upon tablets, so he may run who reads it. We'll get back to that later. He may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Now here's our text for this morning. Habakkuk 2.4 is our focus this morning. What does he say? Behold, he whose soul is not upright, in him shall fail, but the righteous shall live by his faith. The righteous shall live by his faith. So, like I said, Habakkuk was a minor prophet in the, in the early 7th century B.C. Okay? So let me tell you a little bit about what was going on in Israel in the 7th century B.C., Ish. Um, in, se in 701 BC, the Assyrian king Sennach Sennacherib. You remember Sennacherib, right? You ever heard that name? Who's heard Sennacherib? Yeah, Sennacherib. Sennacherib invades Israel. Now, at this time, Israel is kind of split in two, right? After Solomon, his boys get to bickering, and Israel splits into the northern kingdom. And it basically splits into Israel and Judah is what it splits into. And so Israel is the northern kingdom and Judah is the southern kingdom. So in 701, Sennacherib comes down uh, from, from Assyria. And, and he basically wipes Israel out. I mean, he, the northern kingdoms are decimated. The northern kingdom is decimated. And, and Sennacherib makes it all the way to a city named Lachish. Ever heard of Lachish? Lachish, Lachish is a guardian city of Jerusalem. There is a valley that runs up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is on top of a mountain, right? Mount Zion. Uh, Jerusalem is on top of a mountain. Uh, so there, the last sort of guardian city before you get to Jerusalem, when you come up the way Sennacherib was coming, is a city called Lachish. And Lachish is, is what they call a tell. Now when you see in, in Hebrew, they talk about a tell. What's a tell? A tell is a city that's been built on a city that's been built on a city that's been built on a city. A tell is actually a mound. The, a, a tell is a mound. 
So when you see Tel Aviv or Tel Lakish, because it's actually, if you Google it, it's actually Tel Lakish. So Lakish is a Tel. So a Tel is a city that's built kind of on a mound because it's been there for a couple thousand years. And when they get destroyed by an army, somebody comes back and builds it over again. And then it gets destroyed by another army and somebody comes back and builds it again. And what you end up with is sort of an elevated city. So Lachish was kind of the last city before Sennacherib got to Jerusalem. Now, if you know your Bible, you know that King Hezekiah was in Jerusalem at the time. And you know that Sennacherib gets to Lachish and he wipes Lachish out. And he does things to people in Lachish that we won't even talk about this morning. But Sennacherib was a wicked, wicked guy. He was a... He was a guy he talks about, I mean, he talks about the kind of violence, Habakkuk talks about the kind of violence that he sees here in, in chapter 1. And so, that's 701. In 586 B.C., uh, Nebuchadnezzar comes from Babylon and wipes Jerusalem out. So this dialogue that we're having with Habakkuk happens between Sennacherib and Nebuchadnezzar in the time period between Sennacherib and Nebuchadnezzar. Now, why is God allowing all this judgment to come? Why is God allowing all this trouble? Well, Israel has gone crazy. Um, back when, when Yahweh gave the land to Israel, he takes Moses and Joshua aside in the book of Deuteronomy, and he says, guys, listen, I'm going to give you... I'm going to give you vineyards you didn't plant. I'm going to give you houses you didn't build. I'm going to give you wells you didn't dig. I'm going to give you some really, really big life. But you have to follow me. Don't go in there and marry those ladies and worship their gods, or this is not going to go well for you. And so we're... I don't know. If you're an early Exodus guy... You put the Exodus around 1400 BC. If you're a later Exodus guy, you put the Exodus around 1200 BC. So either way, we're seven, five, seven hundred years into this thing, okay? And if my math is right, which it might not be, but we're hundreds of years into Israel's occupation of the land, and Israel has gone crazy. They're worshiping foreign gods. They've forsaken Yahweh, and and Habakkuk is is a guy. He's ministering into a wicked culture. He's ministering into a culture of people who have forgotten their God and gone their own way. Um, which we all know is not uh, this recipe for success uh, spiritually. So, Lachish has been wiped out. Sennacherib comes up to Jerusalem. And for some reason, which we don't know, God preserved Jerusalem for a later time. Right? Sennacherib comes up and he makes a bunch of threats and then uh, I forget exactly what happened but there was some trouble at home and boom Sennacherib leaves the Holy Land and he goes back to Assyria and, and I think he was killed later on by his own man or his sons killed him or he had some sort of trouble and, and the next time we have major destruction in Jerusalem is in 586 but this is the backdrop of Habakkuk and Habakkuk is crying out to God and he's saying I'm tired of this injustice I'm tired of, where are you, God? Right? And we, we're no different. We're no different. Whether your problem, you know, whether you're obsessed with politics, um, whether you have uh, health problems, whether you have financial problems, whether you have relational problems, whatever you're wrestling with, it's pretty human to say, where are you, God? Right? What does he say? I mean, we're gonna. I want to. I want to take some time and dissect the fourth verse of Habakkuk chapter two. I want to take it. I want to take some time and, and look at it because this speaks into our culture. It speaks to where we are as a people, it, especially after the last. Who's, who is so glad they don't have to watch campaign commercials anymore <laughs> on TV? Like. You know, it's pretty bad when a TV the commercials come on here. And you're like, whether you're blue or red, all these people are, are just, if you listen to them, the other guy is awful. Right? Well, you know, they're just awful. 
So I'm, I'm really glad I don't have to hear the commercials anymore, and I probably shouldn't watch that much TV to begin with. But let's, let's take a few minutes this morning and really take a look at this second chapter of Habakkuk, because God answers Habakkuk. And God answers Habakkuk in a pretty concise and a pretty spectacular and a pretty unexpected way, which is pretty much what you get from God. Concise, spectacular, and unexpected. So, I'm going to breeze through real quickly. He says in, in, in verse 1, I'm, I'm using your pew Bible, uh, I, will take my, I will take my stand and watch and station myself on the tower and look forth to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Right? So Habakkuk, he's yelled at God, and then he basically sits down. He says, all right, I want to hear what he has to say. What we don't know is how long he waited to hear what God had to say. Right? It doesn't tell us that. I'm, often I marvel sometimes at what the Bible doesn't say. Sometimes, sometimes what it doesn't say hits me as loud as what it does say. It doesn't say how long it took uh, for God to answer him. And the Lord answered me, and what does he say? The first thing the Lord says is something that the Lord says to a lot of people. He says, write this down. Write it down. Who else in the text, you know your Bibles, who else in the text has Yahweh commanded them to write things down? Right? We get Moses. Uh, we have Joshua, right? Uh, there's just, you know, if you go through the, the Old Testament and you and you look at it, Yahweh is constantly telling people, listen, write this down, write this down, write this down, write this down. I'm not a faithful journaler, but journaling is pretty is a pretty cool activity, especially if you're a prayer, because if you journal and you pray and you journal and you pray and you journal and you pray, you, pray, you can go back and look at it. Write it down, so why? Why does, he, why does he say he should write it down? He says, write it down, make it plain on tablets. So what? So whoever reads it can run. Write it down so whoever reads it can run. That's pretty serious. So things are getting real here. Right? Verse 3, for still the vision, I'm back at 2, 3, for still the vision awaits its time, it hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. What's God saying here? I hear you, buddy. I know you're frustrated. I know you don't like my timeline. But I've got one. And I'm coming. And I'm going to make it right. Now, when you think about the, when you think about the timeline that Habakkuk is dealing with, he's asking, Habakkuk is asking God for justice. He says, Lord, I'm living in a period of profound injustice. When are you going to do something about it? Maybe what Habakkuk didn't realize was how serious what he was asking for really was. When, when the Babylonians came in and wiped Israel out, in 586 B.C., the Babylonians came in and they wiped Israel out in a way that really wasn't restored, even now. I mean, in 1948, Israel became a nation again, and there is a nation of Israel. There are Jews who live in Palestine. It, there, is a, there is an Israel, but it's not the same Israel that Nebuchadnezzar carted off in 586. I mean, the finality of what Habakkuk was asking for was beyond his understanding. And when we think about this in parallel to our walk with Christ, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, Lord, what, what, you know, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Well, yeah, we want Jesus to come back. But there is a profound finality attached to the second coming of Jesus Christ. There are people that you love. There are people that you care about. There are people in our community and in communities all across the world who will be lost for eternity when Jesus Christ comes back because it's over. Tilt, Right? Game over. When we pray, you know, when we, when we say, oh, I just wish the Lord would come back. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a really honest plea in that. 
The same way Habakkuk had an honest plea. And look at what God says to him. He says, listen, buddy. I'm paraphrasing because he doesn't really say but. He says, well, let me read it to you from the translation I studied in. Not because I don't like yours, but because it's a little different. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal, and it will not fail. Though it carries, wait for it, or it will certainly come, it will not delay. The second coming of Jesus is inevitable. It's prophesied. It's coming. You're closer to it today than you were yesterday. Will you live to see it? I don't know. Will I live to see it? I don't know. Would you live different? Would you live differently today if you knew that tomorrow was the day? What would you do differently? See, when God gave Israel to Israel, he takes Moses and Joshua and he says to them, listen, I'm going to give you houses you didn't build. I'm going to give you wells you didn't dig. And I'm going to give you vineyards you didn't plant. And I'm going to give you Hayah. If you know your Bible, if you go back and look at it, what Yahweh says to Israel is, I'm going to give you big life. I'm going to give you big life. Hayah is big life. It's God life. Hayah is the kind of life that you live when you walk with God. It's a Hayah. The Hebrew is, is such a beautiful language, and it doesn't translate well to English. It really doesn't. Hayah is God life. So God promises them Hayah, and he gives them Hayah, and they turn their back on him. And they're judged. Well, God has given us Hayah. We have big life. We have new life in Christ. You're justified. You've been declared innocent before the Father. You're being sanctified. Every day, Jesus is working to make you just a little bit more like him. And you have a future. You have been saved. You are being saved. And you will be saved by the blood of Jesus. That's a big life. So let's get into four. Now it's going to get real. Right? Verse four. I'm going to read it to you from my version. Now, now listen, we've been talking about injustice, social injustice, personal injustice, political injustice. We've been talking about injustice. Habakkuk is just riled up about injustice. And listen to what God says to him. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. Now, I took a very close look at the Hebrew because I wanted to make sure I got this right. Okay? The Hebrew is Pene, Afal, Nefesh, Yeshar. Four words. Four words. Pene, Afal, Nefesh, Yeshar. Your pride's messing up your soul. That's what he tells. Yahweh tells Habakkuk. I'm, and I'm paraphrasing again. Your pride is messing up your soul. Mm. Your soul's not right. Because you got pride. Now, if you're here this morning and you don't think you have a problem with pride, you actually have a terrible, you're actually, if you don't think you have a problem with pride, you're worse off than anybody else, right? At least if you're here this morning and you understand that you struggle with pride, there's some hope, there's some hope for you. If, if you don't think you have a pride problem, then you need, then you need to really, you need to go home this afternoon and, and, you know, walk in a circle in the yard or something and talk to God about it. Pride messes up everything. Habakkuk is crying out to God about the injustice of his life, and God comes back and says, yeah, your pride's messing up your life. Well, I didn't see that coming, did you? Your pride's messing up your life. Are you here this morning and you're married? Are you married this morning? Who's married this morning? Give your hands up. Your pride is messing up your marriage. Who has kids? Who has kids? Anybody have kids? Your pride is messing up your relationship with your kids. Who has a job? Your pride is messing up your relationships with your coworkers. 
What does it say in James? Where do wars come from among you? Where do they come from among you? It comes from the pride that wars in your members. Habakkuk yells at God for a chapter and a half, and God gives him four Hebrew words. Your pride's messing up your life. Your soul's not right within you. It's not just them. Yeah, that, their soul's messed up too. I mean, yeah, when you get, if you're married and you get an argument with your spouse, it's not just your pride, it's her pride too. Your pride is messing up your life and your pride is messing up your soul. Now, the antidote to pride is the Holy Spirit, right? Because the Holy Spirit can whisper to you. The Holy Spirit, you know, what did Jesus do? You say we want to be like Jesus. What did Jesus do? Um, he came and died. Right? That's what Jesus did. He, God, Yahweh, the God who made dirt, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, comes in the flesh, is born in a cave, lives a perfect life. Hebrews says he was tempted in all ways as you are, which creeps me out a little bit, but it's true, right? Jesus was tempted in all ways as you are, he humbled himself. Yahweh humbled himself. And God died on a cross for you. To set you free from your sin. And from your pride. Right? So when you find yourself in a situation where your pride flares up. What's the calling from Jesus? Come and die. You die first. You want to stop a prideful argument with your spouse? Just die first. You want to stop a prideful argument at work? Just die first. I have a rabbi friend who says it's better to be right, or it's better to be wise than it is to be right. Now that's not biblical, but it's funny. Right? It's better to be wise than it is to be right. So God addresses the pridefulness of men in four Hebrew words. And then he gives three Hebrew words. You want to guess what they are? Sadiq, Hayah, and Munah. Right? You know how you fix your pride problem? Sidi, Haya, Emina. What does that mean? It means the righteous, but the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. Well, we could preach on this, I mean, we could preach on this for months. This verse, you could preach on this verse for months. Mike could just, he could just grab this ball and run with it next week and just ride this horse all the way into, you know, January. If he wanted to, the the just, the righteous shall live by faith. Sadiq, Haya, Emina. It wouldn't be un it wouldn't be incorrect of me to tweak it just a little bit for today and say the justified, the justified you in Christ, the justified get big life through Christ, right? How are we saved? We're saved by faith in Christ. You're not saved by what you do. You're not saved by your response. You're not saved by your position. You're saved by the blood of Jesus. Faith in the blood of Jesus is what saves you. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. Okay, that's me, right? But the righteous or the justified, will live by faith. Well, that's me too. So the question is, or a question, for this morning is, what does big life look like? What does faith look like? Right? I mean, faith is a... In the translation, it's... God says, He answers this question in three words. Sadi, Haya, and Minah. He says, the just will live by faith. But those are three pretty big words. Are you just are you just this morning? How do you get just? The only way to get just is by the blood of Christ. We might call it justified, right? If you're just